From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. Uh, We hope that this episode finds you well and uh, relatively sane, despite all the plot twists of what is still somehow 2020. Today's episode is inspired by one of our fellow conspiracy realists and fellow radio man, come to find, Mike, out there in Vancouver. Mike, you called us to say this. Hi, guys. I like your show a lot. Um, I challenge you to do a show on the full true cost of gas. For background, um, there was a time when all our tanks and jeeps were painted green. We were defending Europe and maintaining that ability. Then one day, all our tanks and everything started being painted sand tanned color, indication that the military-industrial complex was all about getting oil. I am um, somebody who specializes and works in the field of energy efficiency and thinks it's ridiculous that we're still using oil for energy. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson has a quote that said, if aliens landed, he'd, he'd be embarrassed to admit that we still use carbon energy from the ground. The full true cost of gas on our health care system, on our environment, on the taxpayer's checkbook is astronomical. I challenge you to find that full true cost gas per for a gallon of gas. It's around forty five dollars easily. Um, anyway, love your show. Love to listen to you guys banter. Um, your great covid um companions. Take care and all the best to all of you. Thank you. So this is a this is a fantastic question, Mike. As any economist can tell us, the price at your local pump can make a huge difference in the day-to-day function of not just your town, not just your neck of the global woods, but the state of your nation and on a macro scale, the state of the world. Empires have collapsed They have risen. They have collapsed again, all to ensure that when you roll up to your local speedway, that's the most common gas station in the U.S., by the way, you'll be able to top off that car. And petroleum, of course, isn't just used for gas. It's used for a multitude of other things. And electric cars are an increasingly viable alternative. But the world still has had serious problems moving away from fossil fuels, and that's not a coincidence. We have massively powerful vested interest and globetrotting institutions dedicated to the maintenance and growth of the oil industry for one reason or another. This industry employs millions of people, it generates billions of dollars, and for decades, people have been raising concerns about that Texas tea, that black gold powering the world. But today's question, to your point, Mike, how much does gas actually cost? Here are the facts. So as of 2016, the United States consumed more gasoline than any other country in the world. Uh, And the average household spent about $2,000 a year on gas. Individual drivers used pre-pandemic an average of 557 gallons of gas each year. Um, and today being July 10th, uh, as we record this, the average cost of a gallon of gas, which is about 3.8 liters um, for our metric system folks out there, is $2.18, uh, $2.184. as according to AAA. Um, this is certainly a lot lower than it's been in recent years. I think when we saw uh, a decrease in driving um, due to the pandemic, I'm not sure exactly how that supply and demand system works, but gas prices definitely went way down. Um, so remember back in 2011 when gas was about $4 a gallon. And, you know, you guys all know that this definitely varies from state to state, especially out west uh, where things tend to be a good bit higher. 
Yeah, and it, there's so much variability, in fact, just within the United States, but there are a lot of other things that affect that price we're going to get into a little bit later. Uh, prices, you know, if you're out west, tend to be about 20% higher than that national average that we're talking about here. And specifically, if you're in California, uh, and anyone who has lived there at any point or lives there now can tell you and assure you that those prices can be a lot higher, maybe 50% higher than that national average. But, you know, and then again, if you're traveling around the country, let's say you're in the Midwest or in the South, the prices actually tend to be about 5 to 10% lower than what you'd find on the national average. Um, you know, I think the three, the four of us here at Stuff They Want You Know can attest to that part. Um, if you go to the Northeast, though, Prices are only, I mean, a little bit higher, maybe about 5% higher than the national average. So you can really tell that there's a lot of variance, but there's also a lot of other stuff, like we said, that goes into that price. It seems to kind of follow cost of living type things, you know, or, or taxes. I mean, taxes in California are higher in general, and cost of living in California in general is a lot higher. Um, I don't know. That's just observationally, it seems to follow to follow those trends. But there absolutely are a lot of other factors like economic unrest, global shortages, uh, and even seasonal variations that can really have an impact on the price that you pay at the pump. And yes, as you pointed out there, we're going to talk about later, uh, offsetting the price by paying for gasoline in essentially roundabout ways or other ways is a major factor in how cheap gas is in the U.S. And we're going to talk about that. Mm -hmm. And and let's let's uh, let's admit this is going to be a bit U.S. centric because we have so much data there. But we also have to acknowledge Europe, as you might imagine or have unfortunately experienced gasoline or petrol, whatever you want to call it, in Europe tends to be higher than gas in the States or in Canada. This is due to higher rates of taxation, and it makes prices historically around three to four times higher than in the U.S., but we can flip it in other parts of the world. Consider many oil-rich countries. Some other countries have subsidized gas costs. That makes it cheaper for per people to buy gas than uh, than taxation. You know, taxation makes it naturally more expensive. Places like, you know, you can already imagine some of these places off the top of your head, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Egypt, Venezuela, and so on. They've all subsidized gas at some point. And the U.S. And the U.S. Ecuador's on the list. Bolivia's on the list. Uh, but these are, the, these have subsidized more Mm, well, it's tricky. They have done more direct subsidization than the U.S., perhaps. This makes sense to the leaders of these countries because subsidizing this cost makes it easier, cough, cough, cheaper, cough, cough, to transport people and goods. But it also means that people are going to be less efficient with gas and it can spell huge problems down the line, both in terms of the climate, obviously, but also in terms of the economy, we have to remember a country too dependent on a single resource is never truly safe. And then, of course, we did U.S. and Canada. We did Europe. We did oil-rich countries. We have to think about the rest of the world because saying the cost of gas at the pump is uh, – it, it feels safe and it feels correct, but it's inaccurate. That's correct, Ben. The the price at the pump metric that we're talking about here doesn't factor in all kinds of things like, uh, let's say, a person's income or a family's, a household's income. So let's let's make up an example here with some made up numbers. Let's say gas costs in some made up country ten dollars per gallon. Sounds sounds intense, but let's say ten dollars per gallon uh, for gasoline. Let's say everybody in this country makes uh, an exact wage of $400,000 a year. Woohoo! Right? Okay, that seems like a lot of money, to me at least. Um, but if you're, you know, if you make that much money and you have to pay $10 per gallon, that's not that big of a deal. It's not going to break your bank. You're, you're not going to be worried about going into debt because you have to buy $10 gas. Sure, it's all relative. And we really do have to consider this relationship between how much... Uh, for in this case, we would say a household makes right because there's going to be shared income, shared expenses. We really have to consider that relationship between all the money that a household takes in and how much they have to expend on gasoline. So it may be more helpful, I guess, in this instance to really think about 
gasoline in terms of local affordability. Yeah, yeah. So there's a there's a really interesting Bloomberg report from 2016 that looks at not the average price of gas at the pump around the world, but the most affordable gas in the world. And they arrive at this calculation by comparing gas prices in different countries to the average national paycheck, right? And went back in 2016, before a lot of things changed, Venezuela had the world's most affordable gas, which is interesting. A lot of people may have, you know, somewhat plausibly assumed it would be a Middle Eastern country. But in 2016, gas in Venezuela was the equivalent of two cents a gallon, two cents U.S. And this was in a country where the average daily wage, how they define paycheck there, was about $16.14. Obviously, this changed as the past few years have been, to put it diplomatically, incredibly tough on the country. But just with that, we can already see how the price at any given pump does not tell you the full story about the cost. So what determines the price? It is, spoiler alert, it's definitely not that person working behind the counter at your local Sitco. Please give them a break. Gas stations make most of their money off of the snacks and other things that they sell you. The gas is just to get you in the door. Have you guys ever seen that show Nathan for you? Oh, yeah. There's a really great episode where he, you know, the whole the whole conceit is that he's trying to, you know, improve the the earnings of like small businesses or whatever with these harebrained schemes. And one of them is that he uh, he, he goes to a gas station and um, gets them to like offer an absurdly low gas price in California, so people will flock to it. But you only get that price with a rebate, so you have to pay the full price. But to get the rebate, you have to like do this like quest up to the top of this mountain to find, to find like this box where you put in the rebate and it ends up being like you know people take this shuttle to the foot of the mountain and then people gradually drop off and then it ends with him and like three of the people that stick around kind of becoming the best of friends only for him to come clean and say there is no rebate but uh yeah that's to your point Ben I mean you know, it's like it's 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 all set I actually worked at a gas station and you know how we would change our gas prices we would look at the other gas station across the street and just match it or make it like a cent lower. It was, you know, very, uh, very rudimentary. But no, it's definitely, you know, determined by a whole lot of factors. Taxes, supply chain, supply and demand, uh, capacity of refineries, and even the uh, the time of year um, all have huge impacts. Um, our former parent company, How Stuff Works, has a fantastic article explaining this whole uh, calculation and how gas prices work. Um, and here's a quote from that. Price increases generally occur when the world crude oil market tightens and lowers inventories. Also, growing demand can sometimes outpace refinery capacity. In the spring, refineries perform maintenance, which can place a pinch on the gasoline market. By the end of May, refineries are usually back to full capacity. Is it kind of a similar calculus to like the way the Fed kind of controls interest rates and stuff? Like when, you know, they make a decision to, to lower the interest rate, you know, then then that changes a lot of things within the system. I mean, I, that's sort of a rough example, but uh, it's sort of a similar. Yeah, well, they're definitely um, they're they're definitely in- interrelated because when the Fed considers that, they are also considering crude oil prices. Uh, but it, it's sort of like uh, at the risk of offending economists. Predicting the actions and results of systems this large, uh, it's very similar to trying to figure out what the weather is going to be like if you're a meteorologist back in the 70s. You can make good guesses. You can have things you want to happen, but there's so many intervening variables. And that's why it's tough to ask ourselves, what does gas actually cost? And then, necessarily, the question follows, what should it cost? This quickly becomes an expensive, complicated question, and in some cases, this cost also becomes the stuff they don't want you to know. But who are they? We'll dive into this after a word from our sponsor. Here's where it gets crazy. So the true cost of gasoline depends almost entirely on what we allow to factor into the equation and the way people approach 
or ignore those factors can create a vast range of conclusions, anywhere from $15 per gallon to, as you said, Mike, $45 or distressingly more. And there are powerful forces that in the past and maybe even the present don't want you to know the full cost of gasoline. And we we do have to point out here, We've talked about it on this show before. We've talked with people who know about this kind of thing. In the past, we have seen that large oil interests have worked together, whether it's, you know, uh, in something like OPEC, where it's a little more forward facing, where you can, you know, you can kind of see it happening, or if it's, you know, behind closed doors. They've worked together to downplay the full cost, all the other things that factor into that oil price. I mean, if you think about it, there are lobbyists out there, attorneys out there who have made millions of dollars taking action like this. And there are also unethical scientists who've cherry picked data. We've seen that before. We talked about it. Uh, on a previous episode, politicians are out there on television and the radio spinning the language, spinning the facts like dervishes from that, you know, you, that Madonna video. You remember. Which uh, was great. Oh, so it really good. was great. Like tornadoes. I think Bjork actually wrote that song. <laughs> Never mind. Move on. <laughs> yes. They, they are tornadoes of uh, slight misinformation. Just I think the word you're looking for dark. is bullshit. <laughs> That's the word you're looking for. <laughs> So, so let's, let's consider this because if we think about the true cost of gasoline, we have to examine what economists sometimes call externalities. Externalities is just a, a fancy, it's a fancy word wearing a tie that means this associated costs that are borne by society at large, but are not directly included in the price you pay at the pump. One of the first ones, obviously, would be the environmental cost. We let's let's take an example from California, since we already st- mentioned some stuff about California's higher than average prices. A single gallon of gas in California produces about 25 pounds of what are called greenhouse gases. Longtime listeners, you've heard us talk about this before. These aren't a conspiracy, uh, but there have been conspiracies surrounding the degree of their effects on the environment. Greenhouse gases are things like carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, fluorinated gases, uh, and also, just to be fair, water vapor. For a fun comparison, uh, think about this, uh, 25 pounds, it's about the same weight as a small to medium dog, like a cocker spaniel. It's also, it's always crazy to me to think about these kinds of emissions measured in pounds. It's just like, you know, because it's relatively, if you think of like the weight of a gas, you think it's like, okay, that's basically weightless, <laughs> but it's not. And it's massive amounts of impact on, on the environment and on the atmosphere. When you think about that number, it's, it's pretty mind boggling. And don't forget that the average U.S. driver buys about 557 gallons of gas per year. Multiply that by 238 million cars, um, you know, and, and not to mention like the much less fuel efficient and more polluting uh, trucks and SUVs and Hummers and Man, that's a lot of poundage of this stuff being pumped out into into the atmosphere day in and day out. Uh, an absolute uh, crap ton of gas. Yeah, I just want to shout out Sarah Terry Kobo and the Center for Investigative Reporting for making a video about this topic where we're getting a lot of this information. It's really just a great video you can check out right now. It's called The Price of Gas. Check it out when you get a chance. Yeah, so with all of this driving, with all this gas buying, a single driver on average within the United States creates or generates, let's say, through that use, about 10,000 pounds of greenhouse gas pollution each year. And to continue uh, these whimsical zoological comparisons, uh, 10,000 pounds is about 3,000 pounds less than an African bush elephant, a male or bull African bush elephant. So, so think of it like every, every year, if you're an average driver in the U.S., uh, you're putting out a small elephant's 
weight worth of greenhouse gas pollution. Doesn't matter where you drive, how you drive, what kind of vehicle you drive. And it takes almost an entire acre of forest uh, to absorb that level of pollution. So uh, for a cocktail napkin estimate, let's say for Earth to handle the annual gas-related pollution from cars uh, plus those trucks and SUVs, uh, let's keep in mind that that's just the daily average um, of, of driving vehicles. In the United States, it could take a forest the size of the entire state of California and Nevada and another smaller state to absorb this level of pollution. So the question becomes, if we're looking at this hypothetical gallon of gas situation in California, how did we get here? Um, so why, like, like all things that we try to do on the show, let's take it back to the source, uh, the source of the oil itself, that crude um, in Saudi Arabia. According to the Center for Investigative Reporting, this is how the process works. The crude oil, which is, which is you know, like the name implies, this has been un, unrefined, uh, raw material. Uh, you should not put this stuff in your gas tank. Um, it's pumped into these gigantic Massive oil tankers. Uh, the biggest one holds, I believe, up to 2 million barrels of oil. Uh, this process releases about two pounds of greenhouse gas for every gallon of what will ultimately become gasoline. That ship travels about 11,000 miles to California. The uh, the uh, the site of our um, hypothetical situation here, uh, when the crude reaches a refinery in California, it's mixed with oil from other parts of the world. Then it's heated, melted, burned to make different types of fuel and other industrial products, petroleum based products. So this process creates about three and a half pounds of greenhouse gas for every gallon of gas you get at the pump. Uh for comparison here, uh, you know, I can't come up with an animal off the top of my head, but uh, uh, it's like the weight of a maybe a two slice toaster. So you so you get a toaster uh, for for every gallon, every one of those two million gallons. Now, now we're. we're now we're shipping that refined gas from the refinery to the station, right? Because it, it doesn't directly go through a pipe from a refinery to your local uh, Stuckies. I'm just going to see how many gas stations I can name in this in this episode. Uh, you, you instead. It goes through a tanker, right? It's transported uh, by a, a truck. You see them all the time. On average, these tankers are going to travel about 50 miles in the U.S. to deliver the cargo. And when it's transferring the gas from the tanker to the tank at the gas station, some of that gas evaporates. It makes more greenhouse gas as well as benzene. And benzene is one of those things you smell when you pull up into a gas station, when you remove the gas cap, there's more evaporation. When you pick up the pump, there's more evaporation. But now, finally, you have the gas. You have a small piece of uh, that gas all the way from Saudi Arabia, and you start driving, maybe to another gas station, like a Quick Trip or a Circle K. Yeah, and then you just you know continue on down the line because there's always more environmental cost to be paid with this kind of thing. And it really does depend a lot on what vehicle you've chosen to drive. You may be essentially prepaying for some of the environmental costs in the energy production for your electric car, or if you are in a, you know, a gas-powered vehicle, um, there's going to be things like the weather that are going to affect how you're driving, things like uh, your mood even, or the music you're listening to. I know that sounds strange, but that might affect how much uh, goes into this. Uh, and also the type of gas, right? How how refined is it? Is it regular or is it that premium good stuff? Or what's what's the middling one called? Like okay, mid mid grade, I, yeah. I guess. <laughs> the the mid stuff. Uh, on average, when you're looking at this extra environmental cost, you're talking about a little over nineteen, maybe twenty pounds of greenhouse gas pollution per gallon. And this part, the driving around section, that's where you're actually letting off the most pollution, around three three quarters of the total. Which is crazy because, you know, often in the past, uh, different factors have been blamed for the pollution. But we have to keep in mind, it's the daily driver who is burning the fuel, right? It's us. We are three-fourths of that cocker spaniel when we get behind the wheel. 
which out of context is a very strange statement to say, but it holds up. And so when we think about pollution, we have to remember we're talking about a long-term price. It's it's almost like a, a layaway cost. It's something everyone on earth has to pay for in some way over the course of their time here, even if they never drive, never touch a car. Uh, and, you know, later generations, descendants of this species will pay some part of that price as well. It just might not feel as steep right now because the bill doesn't come due immediately and it doesn't come due through a single avenue. Yeah, and, and it's like, you know, unfortunately, there are coalitions that, that would, would have us take these uh, these hidden costs into account and the idea of, you know, creating some kind of consensus globally about how much, you know, we want to put out there, how much greenhouse gases we want to put out there. But a lot of that stuff is not uh, enforceable a lot of that stuff is just sort of like an honor system kind of situation. And our country in particular right now, um, because of leadership, is moving even further and further away from that. So, you know, to to our caller's point about aliens coming and being embarrassed that we're still deriving our energy from this dinosaur juice that comes out of the ground, um, it's kind of true. And, and it really does feel like a lot of it is just stacked uh, against us because of those corporate interests. And because, I mean, this is all kind of statingly obvious, but yeah. And, 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 you know, Ben, to your point and what you wrote here in the outline, this isn't just tree hugger kind of uh, flim Flammery. This should not be just dismissed. There's absolutely a, a cost uh, in terms of human lives, uh, in terms of cost uh, of our environment and the habitability of our planet. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you make a, a good point about the problems of cooperation. It also goes into the problems of inequality. Imagine you're a developing nation, right? And other developed nations like the U.S. or Western Europe are all of a sudden changing the rules of the game. So now you are not allowed the same industrial revolution that these other countries encountered earlier. Of course, you're going to be irritated at that. That that's that's halfway through the basketball game or the football game, someone moves the goalpost. It, it feels a lot like stacking the odds against you. It, it, this works on a microeconomic scale too. It is deceptively easy for someone in a higher socioeconomic status, someone who can individually bear the increased costs of a fossil fuel free lifestyle, to kind of look down their nose at the rest of the world. A world I should mention in which. By the way, the average household makes less than the equivalent of $10,000 U.S. a year uh, and look down their nose at, at people who are less fortunate and say, well, just do better. First, that's a dick move. And worse than being a dick move, it's incorrect. There has to be some kind of transition, some kind of plan. A world that found itself suddenly without oil would almost immediately collapse. And even if you feel pretty secure right now, that collapse is going to rock your sh- too. No one would be immune. And honestly, the militaries of the world know this. That is why, in a very real way, the modern history of oil is also the modern history of war. What are we talking about? We'll tell you after a word from our sponsor. And we're back. So, you know, you've, you've probably listened to this show once or twice. Maybe this is your first time. Congratulations. But uh, <laughs> if you've been around for a while, you're probably familiar with the concept that world militaries, governments, large corporations, uh, there's a lot of truth to the stereotype, specifically that governments and militaries within those governments or controlled by those governments are pretty wasteful when it comes to spending. At, at times, corruption uh, it just runs wild within these organizations and, you know, especially at, at the tops. And, you know, one of the, we've talked about it before, one of the major reasons for that is the need to increase budgets over time. That's why you'll see what we would consider maybe wasteful spending because you always have to get a little bit more for the next time around. Um, and, 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 you can really apply this thinking and, and this observation when it comes to gasoline and oil usage within militaries. 
It reminds me of, uh, <laughs> to your point, Matt, that story about how the Air Force uh, spent $1,300 a piece for these like reheating coffee cups because because they were like poorly built. <laughs> And their handles would break. So they they just dropped like hundreds and thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars on these things uh, with absolutely no oversight. And finally, of course, when it, you know, reaches the public, oh, we'll put the we'll, we'll put a stop to that or whatever. But that's that kind of stuff unchecked happens, you know, all the time. And I really want to refer back. I've been I've been wanting to mention this the whole episode. I thought our caller's point about changing the colors of the Humvees and stuff was really interesting. And I never thought of it that way because I think he's really saying it more on the symbol symbolic level but it, it, it i think it's it's apt right like so you know we used to go to war in like jungle regions and, and all of that and then our you know and our and our tanks and stuff were, were camouflaged uh green and now uh that's that that switch to the the sand colored camouflage really has signified the shift towards where our motivations truly lie which is what this section of the episode is about i mean it's it's beyond symbolism right because the green, the green camo won't work in the desert. They can spot you from kilometers away. But it's, I think it's a very, I agree with you guys. I think it's a very astute uh, observation. Of course it changed, and it changed for a reason. And, you know, th- think about this. So everybody listening now has presumably survived April and May of 2020. Hopefully. And if you are listening to this from beyond the grave, beyond this mortal veil, please send us an email. We're conspiracy at iheartradio.com. Uh, but if you're alive, then you know full well that in April of this year, gas prices plummeted. Plummeted is not even an adequate word. And in some cases, crude for a time, crude oil took on a negative value. This was a a real problem for speculators who control a lot of the oil and oil futures market because they were starting to run out of places to store all this excess oil. No one was driving, to your point, Noel, due to a pandemic. And a lot of businesses were closed. In May of this year, when a barrel of something like West Texas Intermediate Crew cost around 20 bucks, uh, 20 bucks, 20 bucks for a barrel that works out to about 50 cents US for a gallon. Uncle Sam was still paying slightly over $10 per gallon for some types of fuel. Now, hold on, you might say. I see the three card Monte switcheroo that you guys just pulled. Armies pay for different types of fuel, right? Some of which is specialized. This is therefore not a fair comparison. Hell yeah, okay, you caught us. The military is paying $10.04 per gallon for a type of fuel called JPL-8. That's Jet Propulsion Fuel 8. Psych, as they used to say in the 90s, kidding again. The you global, rascal. <laughs> we're the rascals. The, the global average price for JPL-8 isn't supposed to be $10. It's supposed to be 2 to $3 per gallon. And where does all this money to pay these inflated gas costs come from? If you pay taxes in the United States, it comes from you. But unfortunately, um, while the, the, the problem that we're dealing with in 2020 uh, might just be a symptom of mismanagement and, of course, corruption and a lot of these lobbies that we're talking about, the longstanding problem goes way, way deeper. And it's at least uh, in part a function of all of those logistics and supply chains and opening up the supply and closing it down like we were talking about um, with that Fed effect. Uh, so back in 09, the Pentagon reported that the, quote, fully burdened cost of fuel. I love that term burdened there. It's very telling, uh, meaning that cost once you factor in all of these things, including those, uh, I believe, Ben, including those externalities. Right, like the cost of hospital stays and things like that, or no, not necessarily. No, no, no. They, they weren't factoring that in. They okay. may have. They may have factored it. Actually, they may have factored in uh, maybe cost of injury for people who are transporting fuel, but probably not. 
Probably not. So let's be conservative here and just assume that this refers mainly to the cost of the the refinement process and for moving it from A to B, from where the crude comes out of the ground to where it gets refined to how it's then transported to the pumps and then into your car. I Uh, would say they might they might uh, bring in the cost of securing certain areas, maybe or military bases. I don't know. Just saying it's that a, might actually no, be a part of it. It's a good it's a good point, and that's the kind of stuff that we probably aren't gonna see like in ledgers. You know what I mean? Um because to your point, Ben earlier, there is so much stuff they don't want you to know about this whole process. Uh for good reason, as far as Uncle Sam's concerned. Um, but that number, to backtrack a little bit, cost of refinement, transport, and and <laughs> who knows what else, but let's just assume that it's refinement, transport, and you know the process of getting it from the refineries to the actual point of sale would be $400 a gallon. Wow. Yikes. Well, and the, the you know, the, the problem here is if that is true, then how the heck is that paid for? Right? How how does that four hundred dollars per gallon turn into two fourteen at the pump near your house or something? Well, it's um, it's America. It's the the financial systems within America that make it go around. That's that's who pays for it. And the average American, through taxes, in probably the easiest way to think about it, is paying for that bill. Um. And, you know, the we haven't even gotten into the concept of the government subsidizing the oil through taxes to get that gas at the pump price lower. This is all this is all kind of a part of it. It's very, very odd to imagine the way money essentially just gets kind of moved around um, and we pretend that it's paying for one thing when it's actually paying for another and we delay costs by paying in taxes once a year. Oh, uh, sure. It's just very strange. Sure. I mean, corporations do this as well. That's why different departments or uh, different divisions have separate accounting lines on their spreadsheet, right? You you distribute the cost. Or in the case of uh, many corporations, you distribute the losses and you keep the uh, you keep the gains or the profits. But but just just for some quick math here. To pull a compare uh, to to walk these numbers out, uh, so we can really feel the impact here. Uh, a Humvee has a twenty five gallon fuel tank capacity. So if it's ever in a situation where the fully burdened cost of of the fuel is considered here, that means that to fill up one Humvee, it could cost ten thousand dollars U.S. And to your point, Matt, yeah, that that money doesn't fall from the sky. Uh, it, it comes from uh, the taxpayers. And this is just an average. That's the weird thing about the $400 mark. In some places, government officials themselves, people who work for the U.S. government, have noted that the price can climb as high as $1,000 per gallon. You know, like something you have to transport maybe via helicopter into inaccessible terrain uh, in the middle of nowhere. And Look, yes, we're using the United States as an example, but this, to be crystal clear, this is a problem common to any globe-trotting military, any <clears throat> any blue water navy. And longtime listeners, you already know, blue water, green water, brown water navy. Blue water is the one that goes around the world. So whether we're talking about Russia, whether we're talking about China, whether we're talking about international uh, Justice League type. Avenger coalitions, like, uh, or some we call them brotherhoods of evil mutants, like NATO, uh, we're going to see the same pattern playing out. As a matter of fact, you won't see this on mainstream news unless you dig in kind of deep into some trade publications. But China just inked, or maybe reinvigorated is a better word, a, uh, a, a new leg of a secretive multi decade deal with Iran. And essentially, the too long didn't read version of it is this, in exchange for what amounts to about a 30 to 32 percent discount on all fossil fuel resources produced by Iran, China is going to take an increasingly larger hold of infrastructure, 
related to refineries and transport of fossil fuels, as well as having a closer military partnership. They're moving pieces on the chessboard. The great game never, ever ended. Uh, but what in, in, what in a similar way, Ben, to the way the United States has moved in Middle Eastern countries for a long time, right? Like we were, we were just briefly mentioned there, the cost of securing oil supplies in other countries ends up being a factor. And ch- it's China making that move in Iran, one of the only places in the Middle East where the United States hasn't officially invaded and uh, inserted itself. <laughs> Yeah, good point, Matt. And pull up the map, folks, if you're reading along at home. Uh, just just uh, do a cursory internet search on your OS uh, demon browser of choice and, and ask how many U.S. bases are bordering Iran. You will see it's, it's literally a ring. The Strait of Hormuz is one of, for a long time, that's what uh, a lot of people thought would be the flashpoint for World War III. Again, as you know, uh, World War III might, end up being over water. Who knows? But this this is just an example, right, of a bigger issue. And it's not to pick on China. As you said, Matt, other countries have done this uh, before in much, in much more uh, blatantly belligerent ways, like, like the UK, like Britain in the Middle East, right? This all means that if we sincerely seek to understand the true price of gasoline – At some point, we also have to start factoring in the cost of regional instability, and we have to factor in the price of war. And this, I mean, this takes us, this is an incredibly important point that doesn't get talked about near often enough, but it's also not the only point, you know, there there are hidden costs. We talked about these long-term bills. What happens when these bills come due? Like, uh, like Noel, you mentioned a little bit about um, whether or not the Pentagon factored in medical care in that fully burdened cost. Is that another externality? What else is out there? Yes. So we've talked about these hidden costs, um, these externalities, and, and whether or not these are actually factored in in a meaningful way. Um, but there are other ones that we haven't mentioned, too, that are much more difficult to quantify. Uh, let's think about oil spills. I mean, in a very callous and calculated way, I'm sure there are some money people that would consider these the cost of doing business. You know, the occasional disaster that you have to pay a lot of money in PR and in cleanup efforts to get rid of, it's ultimately worth it at the end of the day, considering how much money is generated from that product that you're having to clean up. Let's think about things like respiratory illnesses. Let's think about lost productivity when people in places like California, Los Angeles, Atlanta, uh, that have like things called orange smog alerts, that literally the air quality is so bad that if you have a pre-existing condition or some kind of respiratory sensitivity, you're not going to be able to go outside. Uh, It's just the reality of the world we live in. And it's not something that's factored in. Um, And if it is, it's certainly not factored in in a meaningful way, uh, in in, in my opinion, and I think in in Matt and Ben's possibly as well. Um, But let's give a little bit of a snapshot here. Uh, Let's talk about Los Angeles alone. Like I mentioned, the overall cost of air pollution adds up to something in the neighborhood of $100,250 per person per year. And that's because of things like emergency room visits, uh, that lost productivity we talked about, lost work, uh, or missing school um, for children. So Ben, you want to, let's extrapolate something from this. Yeah, if we, if we build out from, from these conclusions, a, a couple of different studies, including Center for Investigative Reporting that we mentioned earlier, including uh, some medical nonprofits and so on, it's not a surprise studies have such a wide range on the cost of these externalities. Uh, one study, in fact, found they concluded that this per year cost $550 billion. Throw up your, uh, what is it, Dr. Evil Pinky there. Uh, or as much as $1.7 trillion, which for most people is cognitively impossible to think of as a real number. Uh, and that's in the U.S. alone. If you add that to the price of the pump, that's where you'll see the conclusions that the true cost breaks down to something like $15 per gallon. But again, like we said, 
it all depends on your methodology. What what variables do you admit, and what what how do you factor them? How do you weight them in countries that appear that appear to have a higher cost uh, at the gas station? Yes, we're looking at you, Europe. Hello. Uh, then part of that higher at the pump cost comes from taxation. And that's interesting to the circle that you're talking about, Matt, because some of those taxes are, in theory at least, dedicated to fighting, to mitigating the problems we described above. So if you're in Germany, you're paying, let's say you're paying $8 per gallon, just pulling that out of the ether here. You're paying $8 per gallon. Well, a portion of that is not reflecting maybe the cost of refineries, it's reflecting the cost of combating greenhouse gas emissions, for example. And it's interesting because that would in, theoretically at least reduce the demand for the gasoline, which should lower that price further. But you're still seeing like, you know, the equivalent of $8 or more per gallon in a lot of those countries. Again, the one of the major things here in one of the last crucial things that we're going to be talking about uh, in, in this episode is that variance. There's so, there's so many factors that go into calculating how much gas actually costs. And when you're, you know, especially when we're trying to research for this episode, you're looking at contradictions made in how people and different organizations are calculating these numbers and how they're getting there. It can be really tough when you're thinking about all of these different possible factors. Agreed. This is an increasingly fluid situation. I'm sorry. Oh and, my and, gosh, uh, it's terrible. And <laughs> and uh, and there there are indications. I'm fluid. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh god, the reviews are going to kill us, you guys. Before before the fossil fuel industry does. Uh, what if we get disappeared by people who hate terrible jokes? What a way to go. Oh, it is, I, would, it, I, I, I would, I would honestly go into that good night, you know, knowing that we'd made a difference. I would just say for being the one non dad on this show as a host, you make the best dad jokes, Ben. Dad game strong. I learned, I learned it, uh, from growing up in the dad joke game under you guys. Uh, <laughs> I, I, yeah, we're, we're here for your dad joke needs as the world burns down. So there is light at the end of the tunnel, though, kind of. Uh, electric vehicles are on the rise, and yet maybe they're not perfect. Maybe they're not as much of a silver bullet or panacea as some people would claim. But the technology is there. It's evolving at a significant pace. And more importantly, the infrastructure to support those vehicles is evolving as well. Dude, we, remember we, just a handful of years ago, you wouldn't see charging stations at like grocery stores, you know, and like outside of Atlanta, you even see them in Georgia now, you know, um, it's not as much of like a bougie kind of, you know, only for the rich thing anymore. And even Tesla, the prices are going down for like a nicer, uh. you know, a nicer electric car that and they're faster now too which i think was a big barrier to some gearheads was like oh i don't want an electric car because it was like you know sort of embarrassing and you couldn't really get a lot of juice out of them but some of these new ones are super powerful yeah but no where where are you getting all that all that power to power them electrical vehicle batteries huh Oh, and you're, that's burning, a, uh, you're burning coal, son that's a good point too it's a good point you make it's all i mean that's the problem you guys with great power comes great responsibility or lack thereof. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, it's true. That's a really that's a, that's a really good point. You know, for a, for a long time, depending on where you were in the world, if you drove an electric car, you were driving a coal powered car, and people didn't want to admit that. But also, I don't know about you guys. I'm super envious of uh, when I see a Tesla drive by, especially one of the, one of the slick ones. But you know, the car car love aside, we're we're correct that forms of alternative energy are increasing in countries across the planet. I'll, yeah, a lot of them are developed countries. You know, the socioeconomic equivalent of the global one percent, and they can afford to subsidize research and subsidize infrastructure, but still it's a good time. You know, for, for a long time, here in the U.S. as well, research into these technologies, deployment of them, was stymied by a ton of factors. Industrial, political opposition, plain old hard technological limits, like you mentioned, Noel, like who wants to buy a car that doesn't car very well, right? If we want to make that a verb. Uh, we also had 
had problems figuring out how best to store solar energy, make a solar battery powering something, and also make it able to work at night with stored energy. There's this, there's also this huge, tremendous cost of making large scale switches from fossil fuel to something new. Quick question for you gentlemen, just really quickly. When you say, you know, the the processes that go into making the batteries for these electric cars, you know, burns all kinds of, you know, fossil fuels as well. Is it so much that it's not worth the fact that you're not having to burn it every time you use it? You just have to like, you know, there's that there's that sunk cost of making it of the manufacturing process. And then you've got the thing that presumably will last you a long time. I, I, I don't know the answer. And I don't know if you if you guys know. We're not talking about manufacturing. We're we're talking about the actual energy that goes from the outlet into the battery to charge the vehicle so that it can drive. The energy uh, that yes, that yes, yes. Is, I'm such a dummy. Right? Of course. Yeah, of course. Uh, no, no, it's it's uh, I mean I can totally understand. Uh, but, manufacturing the, the batteries is also not a that's that's simple why I, yes. and, <laughs> and it's also problematic, right? Oh god, yeah. Oh the rare earth minerals. Uh one of the big things for electric vehicles right now is also just uh, in terms of efficiency, it's trying to get the weight of that battery down. That was a huge problem. And it's still, you know, it's still a speed bump today. So altogether, it seems like the old theory of international politics from Wu-Tang holds true in geopolitics, in international energy infrastructure, as well as in hip hop, cream. Cash rules everything around me. It sounds so, look, yes, it's a fantastic song, but it also, it's also true. Large scale moves away from fossil fuel and all the associated costs with fossil fuel and the associated costs with moving from it only become more and more likely when there is a financial benefit to doing so. There's not, uh, there might be a CEO somewhere who says altruistically, I'm going to move away from fossil fuel because it's the right thing to do. I think Louis Pasteur was right uh, to to spread his innovation around the world. I don't know. Call me a pessimist. I don't think it's going to happen. I think it's going to have to be something in a budget meeting. What do you guys think? Yeah, the, I, unlikely is what I would say. Unlikely that somebody goes through and just changes the world because it's the right thing to do. But – doesn't have to be the case. If you're listening to this and you're running a multinational corporation and you've got love in your heart, <laughs> Put you can change the love world. In your heart. Isn't that song from Ghostbusters? Don't they use that in Ghostbusters? At the end of Ghostbusters 2, when the Statue of Liberty is walking uh, so, out to confront Vigo? Somebody check that and get back to us, please. I don't know why I'm looking at Noel. Noel, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to like nominate you to be in charge of knowing everything about Ghostbusters. I don't remember the song from the end of Ghostbusters. I actually, my mem- my recollections of Ghostbusters 2 are pretty spotty. Uh, not a great Vigo. movie. Vigo's what? cool. I like the little, I, I, I like his little, or what am I dead to you now? I like his <laughs> no, little, no, no. I like his little toady. Um, uh, Janusz. Well, Janusz. Yeah, Janusz. I like that character actor uh, and his, uh, his Eastern European accent is hilarious. Um, but no, <laughs> Where don't, are I, you I, from? I actually the don't even know what song you're talking about, Ben. Put a little love in your heart. Put a little love in your heart. I know. Th- wait, oh, wait, hang on. I think I might be wrong in the world. Of, you know, nope. It's the end of Scrooged, another amazing Bill Murray movie. Uh, you know, genuinely, I was thinking about Farting Preacher. I think he has a line where he says, if you've got love in your heart, let it out. <laughs> and then presumably he farts. Yeah. Oh, speaking of which, you guys, everyone out there, pro tip. If you have an Alexa device, uh, you can make her uh, fart, go crazy. What? And, and, uh, yeah, and she gets into this like crazy fart loop. Uh, and it's very, it's very difficult to get her out of it. Like you'll be, you'll be like, please stop. She's like, would you like a wet fart? <laughs> What kind of fart do you require, master? I'm not kidding. And then at the end, she tries to sell you a premium bundle of farts. Uh, it's all like an upsell thing. I, I felt like I had stumbled upon some sort of hidden treasure, uh, but then it, it just wouldn't stop. So, just- so 
Jeff Bezos is trying to get into the professional flatulism game. I'm I'm not I'm not surprised. Don't let people fart shame you folks either. The average person uh the average part person emits 17 to 23 farts per day and you actually you actually probably don't notice several of them. Also, also in your defense, so brain stuff things coming out. Also in your defense, it's not really you that's farting. It's your gut flora that lives inside you emitting gas. So if you want to think about, you know, you hear the argument about um, farts from humans or cows or other mammals producing pollution, it's the gut flora. It, it, it's not you. It's it's them. So but, speaking of emissions. No, right. Sure. And <laughs> cycles and cycles like, like Alexa, right? We have to remember they're their powerful invested interests, right? Their countries, empires, global corporations, and in some cases, not necessarily naming names in this episode, impossibly wealthy individuals who owe their entire current status to the existing fossil fuel energy infrastructure. They will pay enormous cost to maintain that infrastructure. If they cannot secure a comparable position in a new energy economy, they will fight, make no mistake, to keep the status they currently have. It's kind of a reign in hell versus, uh, you know, Having, having a middle-class job in heaven kind of thing. Absolutely. So first of all, thank you so much, Mike, for sending us that message and getting us to look into this entire thing. Um, hope you are doing well up there in uh, Vancouver, Washington. Hey, so what do you think about this whole subject? What do you think about the true cost of gas? How much does it cost where you are? And what do you think it would actually cost if you were paying for everything at the pump? Um, what's the future of gasoline? Do you think we're going to continue to, you know, drive these cars around, especially now after, you know, the pandemic situation and all of our new at home lives that we've got going on? Um, and also what do you think should be factored in at the pump when you're paying? Is there anything specific that we talked about today that you think is the most important thing and how would we pay for it? We want answers. We're going to change this whole system from our desks at our houses, or at least we're going to advise someone somewhere listening uh, through your ideas. So please, please, please write to us, find us. You can find us all across social media. Yeah, we're either Conspiracy Stuff, Conspiracy Stuff Show, some combination of those, and Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. You can find our Facebook group. It's called Here's Where It Gets Crazy. A um, lot of fun uh, activity on there. Um, just have to answer a couple basic questions to just prove to us that you're not Russian bots. And then you're in like Flynn. You can also find us as individual human people on social media. I am at How Now Noel Brown on Instagram. And you can find me at Ben Bolin HSW on Twitter, or you can find me at Ben Bolin on Instagram. Anybody, conspiracy realists, longtime listeners, first time listeners, anybody writing the email right now, uh, I usually never do this on the fly, but it was important to figure it out. I know that the song in the Ghostbusters 2 soundtrack when they're in the Statue of Liberty, is higher and higher. Your love keeps lifting me higher and higher. That's don't feel the like one. You have to, yeah, don't feel like you have to send us the, the Ghostbusters hate mail about it. We figured it out. A powerful lobby, guys. There are some things that even this show is not going to mess with. So you, do you have any idea how many people have not listened to this part yet, but have already written you a message? <laughs> <laughs> Oh God! Don't don't punish don't punish us collectively. We we got there. We got there at the end, and we do want to hear from you. We do want to hear from you. If you don't care for social media, that totally makes sense. You can go old school with us. We have a phone number that you can call literally any any time. That's right. Our number is one eight three three S T D W Y T K. If you don't want to do that stuff, though, but you still want to write to us with your amazing idea, we're ready for you. Just send us a good old-fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. 
For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.